Um, I believe my schedule is pretty much open tomorrow. I could come on between around 8 and 9 tomorrow if you want me to. You know, I would like to finish that conversation. Now, uh, again, I'm sorry I have a, a, another guest. I actually made a mistake, I'll be honest with you. I double booked. You know, I'm getting old and senile, so that happened here tonight. Now, Michael, yeah. I would like you, if you would like, to hang around uh, while we have this other guest on, and he's going to uh, talk about abductions, UFOs, and things like that. And, you know, you're welcome to ask him questions, too, you know. Oh, I, I would love to meet, I'd love to meet him. Oh, okay, that's great. Hey, Troy, I'm going to let you go uh, tomorrow. Call in at 8.05, and we'll go for an hour. Okay. Okay, thank you, Troy. Good job, thank buddy. Thank you, Gary. You have I'm a good night. forward to tomorrow. Okay, me too. But that's what I, you know, Michael, I, I'm really wondering, because I've had one or two other people that claim they were abducted. They had that same type of pattern on, on their, you know, uh, body, uh, uh, you know, like what you're talking about. Now, I could see maybe if it was warm, maybe a spider bite. But again, to be a bit by a spider, you would be more than this red. You'd have a lot of swelling and you wouldn't probably have it in a you know, that type of, uh, uh, you know, that uh, weight, that pattern of uh, yeah. the, the marks that you have on it that I, from every, you know, that I just don't think that would have happened. I, I really think something strange happened. Have you thought about going and being regressed about that night? Because, I mean, seriously, man, I think something happened to you. Yes, I have, Gary. Matter of fact, uh not a little bit more than a week ago, uh, Mary Kennedy uh, did my first regression session for about uh, an hour and a half and uh, recorded that on uh, tape, video, and that's up on the UFO iTeam uh, Facebook page as well. Um, it's a very interesting, uh, kind of long and tedious for a while. I mean, you got to sit back and relax to uh, hear all that went on, but there was some strange anomalies towards the end that came out in my first session, but uh, we're scheduling maybe another or a couple of them later on to go deeper to figure out what really happened that night. Well, that's why I'm just saying, I mean, again, I'm going by your watch, and now you're telling me you're with your compass on one side where the marks were, it's, it's showing movement. Uh, boy, now, doesn't one of your guys, if I remember from the UFO I team, have a Geiger counter? Um, actually, he has a uh, Gauss meter. Uh, so I will definitely talk with uh, Scotty, our engineer, uh, about bringing that to our next meeting Monday night, live at Denny's where America eats. And uh, <laughs> we, will, we will check that out. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, the same thing, too, if you know anybody into amateur radio, a CB or anything, a field strength meter, uh, you know, maybe uh, holding that uh, antenna right next to your, was it your wrist? Yeah, it was the top of my left wrist. Yes. Very yeah. noticeable. Wow. I mean, uh, Timothy, it was in his arm. And, uh, you know, he had, yeah, yeah it's just kind of strange. It's always, you know, <sighs> I don't know. It, it just, it just the, the pattern of what happened to you that night with the loss of time on your machine, uh, the loss of time period, and then, you know, with your watch, I guess, glowing now twice, and now you're getting a, uh, a, a compass reading on the opposite or on that same uh, hand, uh, wrist. That, I find that really intriguing. Have you tried that compass thing? Is this the first time you tried it? That was the first time, Gary, when, when you uh, suggested that, because I just looked down and noticed that I have a compass here at the desk that I'm uh, talking to you on. So I decided that, I mean, it's a very cheap, inexpensive compass, but it's the old-fashioned one that you would uh, put on a fob, and uh, it works pretty well. At least it reacted very violently, actually, when I got it to my left wrist there. Um, and, of course, we're not even talking and haven't talked yet about the strange other magnetic anomalies that happened around the campsite at Takalak Lake as well, and fascinating other things uh, that happened uh, while we were there. I have never experienced that many paranormal activity that could actually be recorded 
and observed in a short period of time than we did at the Mount Adams incident. Now, didn't a car, according to Troy, a car got magnetized. And, you know, he was talking about, well, maybe it's electronics in the car. No way, any electronics in the car, are you going to be able to get a reading from outside of the car? I mean, if you're right next to, say, electronic ignition or or some, the computer inside the car, if it has, a, you know, solid state ignition, a computer system, you might get some type of reading. But a magnetic reading outside of the car, I find that really, really interesting. That tells me, again, was that car parked? Pretty much where you guys had that uh, light kind of flashing and that uh, the uh, laser, uh, you know, where people saw that laser. You know, um, come to think of it, you are bringing in another aspect of that whole thing. Because, yes, uh, that car, but not only that car, other cars, Uh, my car, my bug out vehicle, Izzy, the Isuzu, uh, and others were parked in the Skywatch field as well. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Only Dan Weiss's car, the one that we're talking about that turned into a bar magnet, only that one uh, displayed any anomalies magnetically uh, once we got the Takalak Lake. So I'm just wondering whether there was something that happened that evening, that Monday night, August 27th, uh, when my machine went off and, uh, of course, other people's cars, batteries died uh, but uh, when we tested the car, the Dan, which is a brand new late model, uh, two year old uh, leased vehicle, by the way, uh, the strange phenomena was that the front part of the car was uh, facing the positive north uh, on a compass, just an analog compass. And, and the back car, part of the car was facing uh, uh, south uh, or negative. So. Um, and it, we tried inside the vehicle to duplicate it. Uh, Scotty, our engineer, brought out his Gauss meter, and the thing just lit up all over the place. But it, my thought was initially it would probably, uh, every all the needles would point directly at the car no matter where we were around the car. But no, it was the front end and the back end were totally separate. And uh, matter of fact, it's been getting worse on that vehicle. I heard about uh, Dan that. White, Troy was saying that. Yeah. Yeah, he took the vehicle back to the dealership and told them, showed them what was going on with the thing. They said they have never seen that before. They even tested other vehicles on the lot where he uh, leased it and the exact same make and model vehicle as well. And nothing nothing showed like his car at Takalak Lake. Well, you know, a lot of reports that talk about UFOs are, you know, they use magnetics to travel. You know, they use the magnetics from planets and stuff, and that's how they get their speed, and that's how they travel. And they have a device that they can, you know, angle it towards a planet, and that's how it, you know, propels it. That's one of their, uh, you know, things that they think maybe does it. But on the other end, I'm just wondering if you had a a major scan uh, before maybe being abducted of the area and that's what charged that car because to charge a car like that you know it's two ways you can do it one is you know remember when you're a kid you'd wrap uh you take a magnet and you rub it on a piece of metal and it'll temporary uh turn that piece of metal into a magnet to it loses its uh charge yes right or the other way is you know like if you go in a wrecking yard they have the device you know that can pick up cars that magnet is not a regular magnet. That is done through electricity with coils of wire that creates a magnet field, high magnet field, which gives it a lot of power to pick up, you know, uh, heavy weight. It tells me yeah. that something, you know, a big, huge magnetic charge had to happen. Now, uh, we got our other guest I'm going to bring on right now. And, uh, Wonderful. And we'll all just keep talking. Well, hi, Kevin. You're on Night Dreams Talk Radio. You're with me, Gary, the host, and you're with Michael W. Hall. How you doing, Kevin? Oh, just great, guys. Thank you for having me on your little radio program. Well, it's not little. We got well over 250,000 listeners worldwide. That's just mean you really know us. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Wait, we're... But, but, we're in the middle of conversation, and, and you, you can, you're welcome to join into it, and we'll start with you. 
is that Michael W. Hall is a, well, he was a judge pro tem uh, up here in Washington State. He's a practicing lawyer. He runs the UFO I team where they go out and investigate, you know, UFO sightings and and they go out and try to prove that or disprove that there's UFOs. But he was at Mount St. Adams here the latter part of August and some real weird things happened, like a car got magnetized for no reason at all. Uh, his uh, piece of electronic medical equipment uh, stopped functioning, uh, and there's a time loss of, of a, an hour and a half or so, and some other weird stuff. So, uh, you know, I, Michael, I'm getting back right to you. I, that's the only way I could see a, a, a car getting magnetized like that, especially when you have the two poles, you know? It, 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 it's the only way it could make sense is it had to be a, a huge charge of something, a magnetic charge of some kind to charge that car. Yes, it's it, uh, very anomalous. Matter of fact, uh, and by the way, Kevin, thanks for joining us. This is going to be a fascinating conversation tonight with yourself and Gary and myself. Uh, but what we did also is we decided, well, maybe there's a vortex right in the area where the car is. So we decided we were going to move the vehicle uh, to a different part of the campground and then test with our uh, you know, compasses and gauss meters uh, where the car was was standing or sitting, and there was nothing, no anomalies at all in that area once the car was gone. We moved the car back, and bingo, it was the car. Wow. Now, was anybody sleeping in that car when all this transpired? I, if there was, has they been checked medically for anything? <laughs> Good yeah. thing. I'm glad you asked because, yes, Dan Weiss, the producer of Ambition Pictures, the film company that was with us at the UFOI team uh, investigation, was sleeping in that vehicle with his uh, uh, 16-year-old son, Josh, uh, uh, one of the cameramen. And uh, it had rained profusely the night before, and their tent got totally destroyed and soaked, so they decided just to hang out in their car the next night. Uh, This was Monday night, the 27th of August. And uh, uh, they were in the car all night long. Matter of fact, the digital clock in the vehicle reset itself in the middle of the night. You know how it blinks, you know, 12 midnight, you know, or 12, you know, uh, when the battery power goes off on the thing. Uh, That thing was totally set back to the factory setting, the dealership guy said. It wasn't just that the power went out. The factory setting on the clock defaulted back to a brand new vehicle where it was, uh, uh, you know, blinking 12. Um, and their vehicle died, uh, in the middle of the night around three o'clock, uh, in the morning as well, trying to uh, keep warm in the middle of the night. It just, the battery died. Now, wasn't that about the same time that something strange happened with you? It was that pretty close to the same time. It was almost exactly the same time, Gary. And as well as, the exact same time, around within the 20 or 30 minutes of what happened on the top of Mount Adams with uh, Lee Strauss, our intrepid camera guy, uh, Philip Wade, the director of Ambition Pictures, and their camera person up there as well. That's when these bright white lights were playing on the top of their tent at 3 in the morning. Now, the funny thing is with that one is that the young guy, the cameraman, woke up with these white lights on the top, coming down from the top of the mountain onto the tent. And um, he looked at his, his clock, his, uh, his phone, and actually confirmed the time, 3 o'clock. And funny thing is, he decided just to go back to bed rather than tell anybody. He didn't wake <laughs> up Phil or, or, or Lee or anybody. He just decided to go back to sleep. And then in the morning, he told them about it. And that's when Philip found this giant red welt on his spine in the middle of his back. Now, did he fall or anything where it could have happened that day before or, you know, to account for the uh, big bruise on his back? No, he said it was totally baffling because when he went to sleep even that night after climbing to the top of the mountain, matter of fact, he mentioned that his backpack has one of those frames on it, so it does not rub on his spine at all. But when he went to sleep at night, he didn't have any discomfort or feel anything on his back. It was only in the morning that he woke up and tried to put his backpack back on 
that there was this raised 